Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation thank you for another week thank you that you kept me one more time thank you that you kept me from some danger that I could see some I didn't see thank you when I woke up this morning I had a mind stayed on you I wanted to come out and praise you thank you when when I woke up this morning I had a reasonable portion of health and strength thank you that I have a roof over my head food on my table clothes on my back I'm saved and you're worthy of praying worthy of majesty worthy of dominion worthy of power worthy of authority worthy of riches worthy of might let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth you're worthy today anything in our lives is not like you we do readily confess come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need I'll take complete control of everything that happens in this house today thank you for the first service manifest yourself again here whatever's accomplished be careful to give your name the praise in the marvelous name of Jesus we do pray and give thanks if you're not ashamed then praise is what you do praise is who you are then say praise God praise God praise God Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus is talking about his conquering community because the word church means assembly or community and the gates of Hades or death will not overpower it. Yet because the church has lost so much value to American people, both unbelievers and believers, I'm returning and just tidying up this sermon series a little bit, Christ Conquering Community. I'll rush on one more sermon and then talk about warfare in the heavens and then come back and hit Martin Luther King Day a little bit and then come on back and try to finish this out. The first message we look at the houses of God, if you don't remember, among us people throughout the Bible. In the second message, we begin to look at why there are certain generations missing from the majority of African-American churches. And we took the book, New Wine and New Wineskins, and began to take those baby boomer, baby buster, various classifications and characteristics. And he put them in the demographics of the African-American community. A civil rights generation born between 1921 and 1940 make the black church what it is today. Uh, that generation set the foundation, the underpinning for what we have today. The black consciousness generation born between 1941 and 1960, this is in your notes, 
committed to black empowerment. Say it loud. You see they up in here. The integrationist generation, born 1961 to 1980, when the black church fell from being the center of the community and the center of our lives. It doesn't seem like we really want to deal with that. We don't really want to talk about it much. We don't want to deal with the fact, uh, yes, we, we've got, still got discrimination, yes. We've still got police killing African Americans, yes. We got all that stuff going on, but maybe the, the issue is uh, the church is no longer the center of our community. Maybe it's got something to do with the church no longer being the center of our lives because when God is no longer in it, I believe that that would bring about all kinds of problems. And then the hip hop generation born 1981 to 2000 which is largely missing from the church. And we've been just touching on those particular problems, those, those, those characteristics, those classifications. And then the answer, which is that the civil rights generation must be preserved, but that they must make room at the table for newer views and newer values. If we're going to exist, if we're going to survive, we need to get younger people to the table and allow them to have their views and visions. That sounds simple, but it's not easy, particularly for those of us who uh, revere the church and honor the church and protect the church and who feel like that young people really don't understand what it's all about, and they probably don't. They don't know, they weren't here and therefore, they don't have a feeling for what you went through, what took place. But we still need them at the table. And then when we allow newer people to come to the table, I try to keep them from tearing the table down. Uh, because they don't have the value they did not go through. They don't have that experience. They don't always honor or know how to honor or deal with those kinds of things. And so we have that tug of war going on in our church right now as the younger generation moves into place and those of us who are older trying to figure out where we belong and where we at. But as I thought about that, I, I came to another conclusion. How can we talk about what's going on in the church when we don't even know what the church is? cannot answer those questions when we don't know what the church is. So that sent me off in a direction of looking at the nature of the church and the seven biblical metaphors, which I've heard people mention, but I've never heard a sermon series on. I don't even know I've ever heard a message on, but I'm, I'm doing seven of them so we can get back to what the church really is, the head and the many-membered body, the vine and the branches, the shepherd and the sheep, the high priest and the kingdom of priests, the bridegroom and the bride, the chief cornerstone and the living stones of the building, the new Adam and the new creation. Just touch somebody and say, he's excited already. And touch him on the other side and say, how can you tell? We've dealt with the first five metaphors. The head and the many-membered many, many body highlights a biological connectedness, the vine and the branches, the organic connectedness, the sheep and the shepherd, a relational connectedness, the high priest and the kingdom of priests, a deeper level of relational connectedness, the bridegroom and the bride share a transcendental connectedness and intimacy. Let's move on to the next one. The chief cornerstone and the living stones of the building. Mm, mm, mm. 1 Peter 2 and 4, and coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stone are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. May the Lord add a blessing of the reading of his holy word. 
Word of God, go ahead and be seated. I'm holding my peace. I don't want to start shouting early on in the message. But I don't want to be disappointed. And he who believes in Jesus will not be disappointed. Now, uh, one, uh, in case you don't remember, we're talking about the spiritual side of the church. Not doing a lot, but touching on the human side because the church is both human and divine. And the human side, we have down. Somebody has hurt you. Somebody in the church has let you down. Somebody in the church is not right. We got that. The church is made up of people. And I was saying to one brother at the racquetball club, he said, why he say it like that? Because I said club one time. And somebody came up to me and wanted to know, well, what club is that that you going? No, 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 racquetball club. I said, if you should find the perfect church, please don't join it. Because it'll no longer be perfect. Churches are made up of people. And people are imperfect. But worthwhile. So it's a very interesting metaphor as we look at the spiritual side of a living church. The connectedness and the intimacy in this metaphor are both physical and mystical. The physical aspect of the metaphor deals with stones that are connected by mortar and the chief cornerstone to form a house. And again, without much understanding of Mediterranean construction, this doesn't make much sense to us. In the Mediterranean building, the chief cornerstone is the stone that, that the entire building is architecturally, aesthetically designed around. So even if there is no organic connection between the cornerstone and the stones of the building, there is an architectural and an aesthetic connection. However, Peter takes the metaphor to a higher height and says that the stones are living. Now, I don't know how you could sit here and look at me with such calmness when we're talking about living stones. I don't know. I, I've been a few places in my life, and I've never seen a living stone. The stones where I come from, West Akron, they don't live, they don't breathe, they don't eat, they don't do anything that living beings doing. They are dead. Consequently, the mystery of this metaphor is that the structure is comprised of a living cornerstone and a living stone. I can't wait to dig down in here. First, he said, it's a tested and a costly cornerstone. It's not talked about just in the New Testament, but started in the Old Testament with the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 28, 60 and 16. Therefore, thus said the Lord, behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a tested stone a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. When you believe in the cornerstone that has been laid, a, a, a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone, a foundation stone, a firmly planted stone, then the stuff that's going on in this world does not disturb you. Uh, the issues that are going on around you can't disturb you. The stuff that the devil is trying to do to you can't disturb you because you have a stone. One writer writes and says the image comes from the ancient quarries where highly trained stonemasons 
carefully choose the stones used in construction. No stone was more important than the cornerstone because of the integrity of the entire whole structure depended upon the cornerstone containing exactly the right line. And if the cornerstone was not exactly right, then the entire building would be out of line. And for that reason, the builder inspected many stones, rejecting each one until they found the perfect stone that they wanted. Rejected stones might be used for other parts of the building, but they would never become the cornerstone or the capstone, the first stone or the last stone. And here Peter applies these words to Jesus Christ. Jesus had presented himself to God as a living stone that was rejected by men. His rejection and redemption were reported and predicted in Psalm 118.22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. If something is marvelous in, our, in your eye, I don't know how you can sit there and kind of take it lightly. I don't know how you can sit there and kind of not get excited about it. It's marvelous. The chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the religious leaders during the period of Herod's temple rejected Jesus as the chief aesthetic center stone in their religious system. They say certainly Jesus is not the one who's the chief cornerstone. Only to build the building and then have him appear at the end of their construction as the chief cornerstone of the Father's kingdom. They laid that stone aside and said we know we won't use that stone. This is not the stone we want to use. The building gets done and lo and behold Jesus is the cornerstone and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now maybe some of y'all can't really relate to that because I thought somebody would shout. I thought maybe somebody might get excited because they themselves understood that they were in ministry and that somebody had rejected them once upon a time and said you don't belong here. You're not the one that we want to use. You don't have the right criteria or characteristics to be the one. But then when they got done building, lo and behold, they, they pulled back the curtain and there you were. The chief cornerstone that God had chosen you and you use you it's all right to be chosen by the president it's all right to be chosen by the Congress or by the Senate but when you've been chosen by God my mother didn't choose me my father didn't choose me but God chose me and when all the world said that you are not the one when this church was started and they said, we, you shouldn't start a church. You don't know how to preach. You're not the one that ought to be doing it. We don't know how you can do this. But God said, I have chosen you. And you shall be mine. My own special. This is a stone today. I, I believe a lot of us are dead stone. But I'm talking about living stones. Seen a lot of dead stones, haven't seen too many living stones. God is using the precious cornerstone and us, living stone, to build up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Well, we've already touched on the fact that of the church being a holy priesthood. We've already preached that metaphor, commissioned for us to offer up spiritual sacrifice. But we haven't touched much on us being a spiritual house. We are the current spiritual house of God. Now, I preached a sermon series on that called the houses of God. But that was so long ago, you don't remember. So we are the spiritual house of God. We are the current dwelling place of the presence of God on earth during this dispensation. We are the permanent place that the Shekinah, 
the visible manifestation of God on earth is manifested during this particular time and dispensation. We are a manifestation of the glory cloud in the tabernacle, in the temple, when God came to show up here on earth. And the reason you miss it is because we don't have the proper atmosphere in order for you to figure it out. Because it is invisible and God is invisible, we can't see. So I've been thinking, since I'm a heretic anyway, I'll just go back to the Roman Catholic tradition and the Eastern Orthodox tradition and get me some incense and bring it in here and smoke the house up so you can see that the smoke represents the presence of God Almighty because as long as it's invisible in here, you miss the fact that God is in the place. He's here right now. But because he's invisible, you can't see him. Therefore, we come to the fact he must not be here. So what the older church folks used to do is just put incense in the place. Smoke everywhere. That smoke represents the smoky presence of God Almighty. When God first showed up and, and told Moses to go to the Israelites, he manifested himself in fire on the mountain and in smoke and in cloud. And the children of Israel, it would seem, I've never heard anybody really talk about this, but you know, I got issues, so I will. It seemed that God wanted to manifest himself to all of the children of Israel, but when they saw him on that mountain and they saw that smoke and that glowing fire, they said, oh, no, we don't want to see that. Just send Moses on up there. Let Moses go and come back and we'll listen into him because we're scared about what we, what we see up there. But that means that they were God wanted them to see the smoke. He wanted them to see the fire. He wanted them to have fellowship with him. To have, so I need to maybe get me some incense in one day and just come in here and they get smoky in the house so you can know he's in here because every now and then we just forget that he's here. Therefore, because we are the spiritual house of God, we have a living, dynamic, um, uh, intimate, powerful, mystical uh, manifestation of an intimacy with Jesus. We are held together by the mortar of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He so loved us that he gave his life and the Holy Spirit so loves us that he condescends to come down and dwell among us. So here we are we are divinely united and and wonderfully connected to God and in an intimacy and to Jesus with an intimacy born together by the mortar of love I'm stuck on Jesus and what sticks me and him together is the love that he has for me Now that's the good part. I, I'm so sorry I got to go to the, the nasty, ugly part. The stones of the building who are closely aligned and glued to each other through the mortar of love are also intimately connected to each other. That's the nasty part about it. When I was preaching about God, I, I thought you was going to come unglued. God, I'm in tow. Oh, yeah, oh. But when I started preaching about your brother and sister, all of a sudden it brought you out of the spirit. We are connected to each other. Above, below, to the left, and to the right by the mortar of love. So that there is a dynamic, intimate, mysterious union and communion between Jesus and his church and between the members of the church with each other. Let's see if we can work it a little bit. So here you are. See that wall? Can you see that wall? It's made out of living stones. And the living stones are in what kind of proximity to each other? They are next to each other. They are laying on each other. And they are connected by the mortar of God's love. So uh, you are... We are in a body that is connected to one another. That's the reason why y'all all rush in here to sit so close to each other. Because we are living stones. 
go ahead and rub up against a living stone right there next to you. Now, if you don't know him, don't touch him. Don't touch him. Say, don't touch me. I don't know you. A living stone. I'm starting to ask the question, are you a stone? Starting to ask the question, are you a living stone? And I'm starting to ask another question, have you, have the mortar of love been applied to you yet? Because when the mortar of love has been applied to you and you've been placed in your proper place next to other folk, then you got stones all around you. I wish I had some help up in here. I'm trying to see which way I want to go here. And so, God is hewing you out. Because in order to get stones here, they didn't go down to the stonemason. Somebody had to go to the mountain and hew the stone out the mountain. And they, they didn't have any tools that said black and decker. They hewed them out with the rough hewn uh, metal implements that they had. And so the stones wouldn't come out exactly looking alike. They would be different. They would be different because each one would have its own unique way of being hewn out. So it's rough and it's not real flat and plain like each one of you are rough. Not exactly smooth like you ought to be and not exactly knowing how to talk like you ought to talk because you've been hewn out of the rough side of the mountain. And so here you are hewn out and then they fit you in place and slide you in and add the mortar of love all around you so that you are connected to other folk. So God fitted you out and he's working on you not so you can be by yourself but so that you can be next to somebody. Oh, I'm... I'm I wish I had some help in there. Ah, let's go back to God because that was more exciting. No, I'm talking about the person right next to you. That when I took over there and say, turn to your neighbor and you look at him like you ain't no stone. And maybe you are stone, but you are dead stone. No mortar of love. No, don't touch me. Who are, you don't know me. You are supposed to be a part of, I'm, I'm coming to that. Let me say that. Let me say that. An intimate, mysterious union between all of us. The mysterious nature of God's work in a miraculous way. I, I want to go back to the bar. Can I go back to the bar? No, not me. I ain't never been to the bar. But for your sake. We talked about the bar about five or six weeks ago. And, and I, when I talked about the bar, I came into the conclusion and the realization that a lot of you know a lot about the bar. So therefore, I need to align my teaching more with bar principles. In the bar, you go over there and you get spirits, get the spirits, and there you begin to talk to folks and the devil does not care what kind of relationships you have over there. He's not trying to stop you or bother you because that's his domain. Just go ahead and have the best kind of time you want. And what's interesting to me, and I'm getting ready to get in trouble so deacons get ready. I may have to run. And what's interesting to me is that people who sit on a bar stool full of spirits feel that their perspective of their relationship are accurate. Oh, stay with me, but just stay with me a little bit. So here they are. You know, I never had those kind of problems till, till I came to church. Well, no, you ain't had no problem sitting on the bar stool over there drunk. Thinking that you're in deep relationship with somebody. Clouded by alcohol. Thinking you having a deep relationship. Drunk. I don't know how you could think that anything that you think you're doing over there is accurate when you're inebriated. But it's like the same thing I'm dealing with people now who are caught up in grief situations, torn up, messed up in, in separations and divorces and all kind of stuff going on, thinking that their relationship and that their, their thinking is accurate and rational. You tore up from the floor and you think that your thought is rational? 
Well, you know, the way I see it is, and I want to say, you're sick. You don't get it? You're sick. That's how we are in church. Sitting here, unaware of the fact that there is a supernatural dynamic thing going on. Cannot see it with our own natural eyes and therefore miss the reality that God is up to something right here, right now, in this place. I can't see it. I, I, I can't see it. A whole lot of things you can't see, brother. I can't see what God, he don't have to see it in order for him to be doing it. At night, because of where I live, I can't see the sun. But it's still there. Still providing warmth. Still providing certain things. Still providing the ability for us to have light. I can't see it, but it's there. When the clouds come out, guess what? I don't see it, but it... It's still there. If you had spiritual sensors and discernment, you would be able to see God operating in your life and understand that you are joined together by something beyond. Oh, I got to work this. Y'all got to help me here. Le okay, let me get another metaphor. That ain't working too good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll make myself a note. Uh, throw that one away. Get another one. Let's, let's, it's Thanksgiving time. Let's talk about that one. It's time to go visit our relatives. Now, just so, let's, let's get this straight so that we are okay. I, I, I don't have that problem at my house. We determined this years ago. That if folks don't like me, and they talk about me and whatever, I don't feel no compunction to go to their house just because it's, just because it's Thanksgiving. You know, I, I don't have that problem. Uh, I ain't got to go. I don't feel no pressure. You know, Christmas come, I ain't buying you nothing. We don't have it like that, okay? It ain't no problem. You ain't got to buy me nothing, so therefore, we just, uh, we just separated it. And, when, and long ago, I just talked to my wife and said, look, if you don't want to go over there, we ain't you know, got to go to your mama's house, then go to my mama. You ain't got to go. Stay home. Because I ain't going to your mama's house. Let's be completely fair. You don't have to go to mine either. You go if you want to go. If you don't, you don't. Now, when we go to Thanksgiving dinner, there will be relatives there. Um, I, you don't like all your relatives? <laughs> Brother Gordon doesn't like all his relatives. <laughs> some of them you like, some of them you don't. But you go in and you do what? You tolerate them, you do whatever you got to do, and you, you come on out. I mean, you go in there, you know your uncle going to be there. You know he's going to be drunk. Everybody know that. Everybody know he's going to be drunk. They know he's going to be asking for money. And they know, don't put your, put your, watch your purse. Keep your purse with you. Don't lay it down nowhere because you, you know how uncle so-and-so is now. We done told you. We done told you. We told you now. So you go over there, and you ain't got to love everybody, like everybody. You just go in and they're my relatives. I speak to them. I, 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 I high-five them. We eat this dinner, and then I lie out the door, go on out the door lying. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> and I'm telling them, no, I, I won't see you no more to next Thanksgiving. <laughs> but we don't do that. We, just, we know how to act. We act nice. And we, it's our, it, it, they're our relatives. Well, you got spiritual relatives. Why you come up in here acting like you got to like all your spiritual relatives? You ain't got to like everybody in here. You just got to love them. You got to put up with them. You got to sit beside them. And when I say touch your neighbor, you got to act like you really want to. Don't act ugly. You know, that's not the way you should act. You don't, you don't do it at, at, the, at the Thanksgiving thing. So just turn to them because you ain't got to be bothered with them for about another 30 minutes. Then you can go out and say, well, what did he touch me? Ugh. I know how y'all do because I've been in church all my life. 
The problem is you don't know that the people you're sitting next to, you got a deeper relationship than with some of them people in your family. Because everybody that's an in-law, you ain't really that deep with. Come on, somebody. I wish I had some help up in here. But you can get close to people when you have a common denominator like the Holy Ghost. Like the church and what God is doing. And God can do some outstanding things. So, Ephesians 2.19. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Oh, somebody help me. Somebody help me. You are no longer strangers and aliens. So when I tell you to touch your neighbor, don't look at them like no stranger. The way y'all look at folks when I say touch somebody, you look at them, you might as well just put right on your forehead, you stranger, you. You alien, you. Don't touch me. But we are no longer strangers, aliens. Now, y'all are sharp enough that I think I can go a deep, little deeper with you. Y'all sharp. So I don't care what we say about the 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 church and the uh, how deeply we're related. Uh, that's wonderful stuff. And I'm, I'm going to preach you some more a little bit in a minute. It's wonderful, but it don't make no difference. Because church people, if there isn't a certain level of unity, we fall out regardless of the fact that we got a Bible that tells us something different. Got to be unity. I, I need unity. I need to, I don't know why we can't get together. Well, I just told you why. This ain't no bar. This is the church. And the church, the devil does what? Everything he can to block your ability to have a relationship with somebody else. It is a spiritual warfare. Why don't we get that? The devil starts before you even when you're at home. Before you get here, he's trying to block you. You get here, you can't park in there. You try to pull in the parking space and somebody pull in it ahead of you. you. And you're mad right there. You come in and the usher didn't speak to you and then told you to sit over on the left. You want to sit on the right. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. And from the time you get here to the time you leave, the devil is trying to block you. Don't you think he knows, I don't want you to get the word of God. I don't want you to touch anybody else. I don't want you to have a relationship with anybody. He's trying to block you. This ain't cheers. Where everybody knows your name. This is the house of the Lord full of people who got issues that the devil is all in the midst of it trying to mess it up. But in the midst of that, there is a dynamic Holy Ghost who is working some stuff out. Okay, watch the, watch, the, watch the language then. So because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we are a part of a living house. We are no longer strangers than a living house. I've never seen a living house. What would it be like if you went home today and your house was breathing? You drove up to your house, you saw the sides of your house going like this. It was alive. What would it be like when you got home today if your house had grown? Yesterday your bathroom was small, you come back today, you got five extra feet. Your house has grown. That's a dead house. It don't grow. It don't breathe. But this is a living house. It grieves. It, it grows. It breathes. It's dynamic. Oh, I wish I had some help on that. Oh, I'm coming. Don't go nowhere. I'm coming. 
We are fellow citizens with the saints. We are citizens of the commonwealth of spiritual Israel. We are God's household. We are now the permanent dwelling place of the Shekinah of God on earth. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In Jesus, the whole building is being fitted together, literally fitted together. It is living. It is growing. It's a temple. It's the holy of holies. It's the permanent dwelling place of God. And the problem is, because we are Americans and we are riddled through with individualism, it's, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if it's possible for us to understand the collectivistic nature of the Bible. It's, we're individualists. So we read all this stuff like, I, this is what I'm going to do and this is what I got because the Holy Ghost is in me, so I am the church. Uh-uh. Almost all the use of the New Testament are plural. Know you not that the Holy Ghost dwells in you, plural, not you individually, you, the church. And because we don't understand that, then we think we can be all by ourselves what we are and don't recognize that everything God's doing to you, he's doing because he wants to fit you next to somebody else. Oh, up, up, up. I'm going to say it again because I know you missed it. Everything that God is allowing in your life, everything that God is working in your life because he wants to, to take and plane you off so you can fit next to somebody else. Y'all don't like it over here. Let's go this side. So everything he's doing in your life, all that he's allowing, the pain, the struggle, the issue, are not so you can separate. They're so he can plane you down so you can fit. Oh, there go the problem right there. I don't want to fit. There go the problem right there. I don't want to fit. Oh, there goes the other problem right there. I don't want to grow. I want what I want. We all want that. But we want to go where God wants us to go, right? And if we want to go where God wants us to go, he's going to have to allow some stuff to go on, some difficult stuff that planes us down that rubs some corners off of us, that knocks some pride out of us, that allow us to be fitly framed together. Oh, this ain't preaching. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. This ain't preaching. I'm just, I'm just hollering at myself. So watch this. This ain't preaching. I'm just messing up. So notice that it's a building being built together. The church is not an association of individuals, but a collective of persons being built together. Okay, so watch this for a moment then. If, if y'all would have said amen, I could have got done quicker, but when people don't say amen, it makes me preach long. So watch this. Well, look at the intimacy. Just, just think about the, I'm just going to go back through the, through, the, through, the, through, the, through the nomenclature. Fellow citizens fitted together, growing together into a holy temple of the Lord, built, being built together into a dwelling of God, household of God, temple of God, dwelling of God. The cornerstone and the living stone of the building share a physical and structural intimacy. So therefore... My last point, I'm going to elaborate a little bit depending on how I feel, and then I'm going to get up out of here. Uh, we are not simply a social organization. We are what we are together. The Africans would say it something like, I can't be you, me, without you, and you can't be you without me. It's together that that takes place. As I was reading, finishing up a great little book, I'm not going to give you the name, title of it because I don't want you to have it. It's, it's not quite, it doesn't quite have the right perspective that I want you to have, so I won't admit, but it, but it, it said some powerful things. And one of the things that it was talking about was that you, the best, the, the, the issues of life, the, the stuff of life 
takes place between people. The issue, just put up with me a little while longer. I'll be out your way. The issues of life, the stuff of life takes place between people. We're doing everything we can to get away from people. We're doing everything we can not to interact with people. But it happens between people. God decided to create some people. I don't know about you, but that's pretty big. He could have created whatever he wanted to create. He created angels. He could have created um, freebles. He could have created, um, I don't know what you want to call them. He could have created anything. But he decided to create some people. And that, that was big. But then he decided to become one of us. So he could interact with us. Everything, therefore, that happens of any significance happens between people. You can't grow until you run into some nasty people. You don't grow sitting at home reading the Bible and praying. You grow when you got to interact with somebody who gets on your nerves. You grow when the sight of them makes you want to throw up. You grow when they hurt your behind. You grow. I'm trying to help the choir up here. I'm trying to help the choir. That's when you grow. You don't grow by sitting at home. You don't grow by separating. You don't grow by running. That's where the growth is. Jesus, tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. You know how I know what kind of Christian you are? Excuse me. Do you know you know what kind of Christian you are? Excuse me. Do you know how to evaluate what kind of Christian you bees? I'm trying to get what the people understand me. They may not understand what I'm saying. Do you know how to evaluate yourself? You evaluate your Christianity when it is tested. When you got to deal with somebody you don't want to deal with. When you're called to love the unlovely. When you're called to put up with people you don't want to put up with. When their breath stinks. When their deodorant is not working. I don't know why I'm coming this way, but <laughs> must be something going on, on over here. I don't know. <laughs> we are not a social organization. We are the temple of the living God. And God's trying to build us together into something so we can offer up praise unto him when I said in the first service or I said in the second service don't, don't get offended and if you do you want to get offended that's okay too you, be, you're offended. you know sometimes you need to get offended you need to get shouting glad or fighting mad one of them will send you back to the Bible when, when we tried to get everybody to sit together and we don't want to do that because we got issues and uh, I'm, I'm too old to play some games just understand that we were sitting at, remind me what I'm getting ready to say right here because I forgot in the first service I was talking about seating, remind me of that because I, I, I'm older now I start off on a tangent and I forget where I was we were in the staff meeting, Elder Johnson got up and pushed his seat in and started walking out. He said, well, Elder, Elder, where you going? He said, I don't have time for this. Y'all go ahead, do what y'all gonna do. I don't have time to play. My time is too short to be doing what y'all doing right now. So I'm at that point in my life, I'm 60, how old is I? 62. <laughs> 
be 63 in March. There's certain things I don't have time to play with. So you can like it or not like it. I'm just going to tell you. So we, we, we're trying to get people to move together. Because how can you build a building and all the stones are scattered all over the place? Somebody help me with that. Trying to build a building and you got a stone over there and a stone over here and a stone over here and a stone over here. You got to get them stones together and get some mortar of love around them. So, that was my younger days. I didn't know no better. I was just trying to do what was right. So, I put some ropes up. And the saints of God <laughs> took the ropes down. I'll sit where I want to sit. You don't tell me what to do. And I, I just don't, we don't fight you anymore. I'm just not fighting that anymore. We, I, I thought about it again. I may ought to put some more ropes up, but if I do, we may have to whoop somebody. And I don't want to interrupt the service having a, somebody whoop you, carry you up out of here. When you are that kind of attitude, are you a stone? Are you a living stone? Has any mortar of love been applied to your carcass? Now, you can like it or not. Don't get paid by what you like. The Bible says the true shall know the true, and the truth shall make you free. I'm more interested in making you free than I am you liking what I got to say right now. I'm too old to play those kind of games. So I'm asking you now, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna put no chains up and no, no, nothing else. Be a stone and come closer. The next time you come to church, Come as close as you can. I got, I got one more diatribe and I'll leave you alone. I'm in pain today. Because the Cavaliers done lost five in a row. I can't hardly praise God today. I'm trying to feel light. But I'm way down. Now, I've only been to two or three Cavs games. It's the view in my living room for free it was better than the view I was going to get up there. But when I did go, we were in the nosebleed seats, way up there. But at halftime, we noticed some people were leaving. We didn't know what that was all about because I've never had a seat down there. But I imagine if you have a more expensive seat and you um, are at the game, there comes a point where you want to get out to beat the traffic that you just had up and leave. Me, we just figure out, let's go down. So we came down about five rows. <laughs> Waiting on somebody else to move. About midway of the fourth quarter, we down about the third row. I'm trying to get close to the action. I might be able to see LeBron. What's up, LeBron? Might be able to touch him. I might be able to get over there. I don't know. He might see me, recognize me from the movie. What's up? More than the game.
at the end, we kind of get down on the court. Get down where the, where the ropes is. Hey, stop me from putting my foot on. I'm on the court. I've been on the court. Come to church and you want to sit as far away as you can. Now, maybe I should take that personally. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should take that personally. I ain't LeBron. Not many people are. Maybe I should take it personally. He ain't saying nothing worth the while getting down that close to. There's nothing that hot going on at the church that I need to get that close. What's wrong? Let's bump somebody and say, Joan Rivers. <laughs> I'm just talking about realities that we don't want to face. Now, I don't take it that way because I know who's messed up. You are. I know I got something to say. I know God put a word in my mouth. I know it will set people free. I know they can be delivered. I know what he will do. But you have to want it. You have to get excited about it. You have to say, I'm going to church and ain't nobody going to get in my way. I want to get as close as I can. I want to praise him as much as I can. Because remember, the further away you are, the more you see. And the more you see, the more it just distracts you. That's why I come down close to the front, even when I'm not preaching, and, and I don't sit with my wife because I don't want her bothering with me. I don't care. She don't care. She can tell me at home. She'd be mad at me. I don't want her bothering with me. She likes to talk and fidget. Don't talk to me. I'm trying to hear what the man of God is saying. Don't talk to me. Don't say nothing to me. trying to worship the only time I'm gonna to talk to you when the man tell me to talk to you I'm right back where I was I want to get I need everything I can get I need everything I can put my hands on I need everything God can pour down inside of me I need to get as with my heart I need to get as close as I can because there's issues in my life and lust in my life and, and stuff in my life that I need to get as much as I possibly can, as close as I possibly can. Now, for all y'all who mad at me, is I, I get more when I'm back. Do your thing. I'm too old to argue or whatever, but I'm just telling you that's tough when we can't get together. And I'm just going to say it. So I'll just have to take the brunt. You can email me at. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. Not on Instagram. I'm not any on that. So because some people are saying, well, I've been talking to you. You ain't talking to me. You're talking to an imposter because I'm not on there. I email. That's as far as I'm going right now. I nobody going to put me on Facebook all the time. Ain't nobody going to tweet me. All the time. I'm in the restroom now. <laughs> Ain't got no light. Okay, okay. We are not a social, organiz a social organization. What we are is the body of Jesus Christ. Somebody give God a hand clap for that. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you don't know Jesus, you might want to be a part of this body. And if you want to be a part of this dynamic, intimate connection, repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin I've sinned against you. Come in my life. Save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. 
and giving me eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. These are altar workers walking. They want to pray with you that you know what it means to trust Jesus. You need a church home, just get out of your seat. Don't worry about nobody. Come down. Say, I want to join. They'll, they'll tell you what to do. The rest of us ought to be praying, Lord, help me with my attitude that I might be able to be a living stone. I'm going to sing just a little bit because I went longer than I intended to. I'm excited and I'm serious and I'm passionate about this. So I'm just going to sing a, a little bit enough to give people a chance who want to give their lives to Jesus today. Anytime when I'm singing, feel free to come. I've had some good days. And I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days and some lonely nights. And when I look around and think things over, all of my good days outweigh my bad days. And I won't complain. Sometimes the clouds hang low. And I can hardly see the road. And I ask the question, Lord, why so much pain? But he knows what's best for me. Although my weary eyes, they can't see. So I got to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I. Complain, the Lord has been good to me. He's been so very good to me. More than this whole world could ever be. God has been good to me. He dried every one of my tears away. Turn midnight into day so I gotta say thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord I've been lying on but thank you Lord I've been talked about but thank you Lord misunderstood but thank you Lord I've been sick, but thank you, Lord. I say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I, I won't complain. While I'm there, just forgive me if I say blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit. And wash in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. 
praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the Father, thank you today. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for your house. Thank you for this family of God. Thank you for the opportunity to come and to put my voice together with the saints as we come to magnify and lift up your name because praise is what we do. Praise is who we are. And we magnify you today. If there's anything that I said that offended somebody that's not in the gospel, Lord, take it out. Let them know I'm sorry. But every offense that flowed from your word, let it stick. Until there's a change in our lives. Thank you that I'm saved today. Thank you. I will not complain because you've done so much for me. And I'm glad. Bless the choir now. Use them to offer praise to you. And may we, Lord, not be spectators but participants in the praise that is offered up. In the name of Jesus, we do pray and give thanks. Somebody shout praise God. Amen. Choir. 